Like we said, we're starting a brand new series called Confronting Anxiety Today. If you're here and you've experienced anxiety in the last 30 days, you are not alone. If you're here today and you've experienced anxiety in the last 30 minutes, you are not alone. And I love hearing from Ellie about her kind of quirky anxiousness, like on an elevator without a bottle of water. I love hearing that. That's the way I am when driving over bridges. When I drive over a bridge, I'm thinking worst possible scenario. I grew up during the 80s watching the World Series with the Oakland A's and the San Francisco Giants and and the big one hit, and there's literally cars falling off the bridge. So anytime I'm on a bridge, like I'm thinking of an escape route every single time. What I want you to know, whatever may make you anxious, you are not alone. The ADAA says this, Anxiety and Depression Association of America, they report that 40 million Americans struggle with specific anxiety disorders. And whether it's a specific disorder, it's just everyday anxiousness that we all feel, maybe you can relate to this, that it affects sleep patterns, relationship, focus, work output, and general health. Again, you are not alone. We're anxious about our health, our finances, the the political situation of our country, racial tensions, putting food on the table, romantic relationships, kids, where we're going to live in the last couple weeks, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. (laughs) Anxiety can hit us and overwhelm us at any moment. And yet Jesus says this, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. The Apostle Paul says this, don't be anxious about anything. Now if you're here and you're not following Jesus, we're so thankful that you're here. And if you join us for the next couple weeks, we hope you see that Christianity doesn't provide uh, kind of shallow life hacks towards anxiousness. That in fact, it provides for us something much deeper, much deeper answers that actually meet us in our everyday struggles. But the question for all of us is this, how do we live with this non-anxious presence when there's so much for us to be anxious about? And what we want to do as a faith community is we want to confront anxiety. We want to look anxiety dead in its eyes. We don't have to deny that it's there. We don't have to kind of lock it away in a closet and act like everything's okay. We want to look at it square in the eyes and allow gospel truth to confront that anxiety, allowing gospel truth to carry us to a place of supernatural peace. I want you to hear this today. Peace is possible. So we want to confront anxiety with gospel truth, and we want to ride the waves of gospel truth until we experience a peace that doesn't come from this world, but a peace that comes from above. Amen? One quick but important caveat as we talk about anxiety. When talking about anxiety, there is a wide spectrum of experiences, And in every case, we want to be a people that depend on the Lord, look to God's word for hope, and cry out to God's people for love and care. But in some cases, in addition to depending on the Lord, you may also need to take the step of seeking professional or medical assistance. And so what we want to do just in in this moment is kind of remove any taboo about seeking professional help. Carrie and I seek professional help. If you knew our marriage, you would know we need professional help. But you're not less of a Christian if you seek that help. In fact, when you seek that help, you're recognizing the good ways that our good God works through science and works through the experience of others. Amen? Amen. Today, as we start this series... What I want to focus on is our perceived worth and value as humans. What's the price tag that you would place on your life? 
how valuable do you really believe you are? And I want us to acknowledge the very natural temptation, the very natural process for each and every one of us to look to others to determine our worth and value. We look to our friends, we look to family, we look to social media, colleagues, coworkers, and institutions to validate our worth and value as humans. I don't know if any of you guys have seen the Antique Roadshow on PBS. It's not a show that I would ever like set aside time to watch, but every once in a while when I'm like scrolling through the channels, it can kind of just captivate you in a surprising way. And if you don't know what the Antique Roadshow is, it's this traveling show um, that goes to different towns and communities, and people in those towns and communities bring their antiques. And there's this expert there that's to, there to evaluate the different antiques. So it's like this little old lady that found this like spoon in her attic, and she believes that this spoon was there since the 1700s, and she brings it on the antique roadshow, and there's the expert that looks at the spoon, smells the spoon, and tells the little old lady that the spoon is worth $10,000, and the little old lady is jumping around. She's so excited. She can't believe she's got a spoon that's worth $10,000. I think there's a temptation for all of us to live our lives in such a way where we kind of platform ourselves and we allow the people of this world to tell us our worth and value. And I just think this is a soul-crushing experience because I think there's this temptation. I believe that our anxiety increases, it escalates, as we're constantly looking to other people to tell us how valuable we are. It's the soul-crushing experience because we understand the validation we receive in this moment might be gone tomorrow. And so if we're not looking to the world for validation to determine our worth and value, my question is, where should we look? I'm gonna give us a vision for where we're heading today. Instead of looking to the world, I want to encourage us to look to creation, look to Jesus, and look to the church. And by the way, like, my points always have something to do with Jesus and the church, so just get ready, guys. Okay, look to creation, look to Jesus, and look to the church. And I think here, we're going to find gospel truth that's going to carry us to a place of supernatural peace. If you have your Bibles, let's look at that first point. Open up to Genesis chapter 1. If you don't know where Genesis is, it's the first book in the Bible. And we're going to look at the first chapter in this book, Genesis 1. And let me just give us a quick little kind of Bible study tidbit. If you want to know your Bible better, if you want to understand how this word kind of works as a unified story, we're always going to have to come back to Genesis 1, 2, and three. These three chapters are so significant to everything else God is going to do through the scriptures. It also provides these three chapters the framework for a biblical worldview. Now, whether you're a Christian or not, each of us have a worldview, and each of us are forced to answer questions like, where did we come from? What's gone wrong with this world? And what's our hope for a better future? These three chapters provide us a framework for a Christian worldview. And again, you're here and maybe you're not a Christian, you still have to answer these questions. And there's a number of different worldviews out there, and it's our responsibility to kind of figure out which worldview makes the most sense. What worldview answers these questions in the most complete or compelling way? What's my point? These three chapters are really, really important. And for our purpose today, we're just going to look at a couple of verses. We're going to see that these verses teach us that every human being is endowed with worth and value as an image bearer of God. Every human being is endowed, is given worth and value as an image bearer of God. Let's read verses 26 and 27 of chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Every human being is stamped with the image of God. Every human being is stamped with the image of God. We are derivative. He is the starting point. And what this means is that we don't create our worth and value, we receive our worth and value. One more time. We don't create our worth and value, we receive our worth and value. And again, if we fall into the trap of trying to create in worth and value, I just think it leads us down this road of anxiousness because we're constantly wondering, are we good enough? Did we do enough? A- a- am I pleasing enough people? Here we see we, we don't create it, we receive it. And because we receive our worth and value, every human being stamped with the image of God, this is why we believe all people are created equal. This belief of equality, a belief that we take for granted today, is a distinctly Christian belief. Ancient societies would have scoffed at the idea of equality. And I know Christians haven't always lived up to our theology, but where did we get the idea that all people were created equal? We got it from the Christian tradition, the Christian faith. The reason we can say black lives matter, the the reason we want to partner with Love Never Fails and get young boys and young women off the street, the reason we're partnering with Foster the City and believe that every child in the foster care system deserves our fight, our love, and our care, The reason we engage in these things is because we believe every human being has infinite worth and infinite value as those made in the image of God. And this includes you. I want you to know, in the eyes of God, you've been given infinite worth and infinite value. There's been this unique conversation going on in the sports world about sports and mental health. And just recently, this year, there was a young basketball player. He was actually at Stanford a year or two ago, got drafted into the NBA. So he's at the prime of his career. He's in Dallas on the Dallas Mavericks, and suddenly, out of the blue, he retired. Listen what he wrote on his social media. This is Tyrell Terry from the Dallas Mavericks. This message is a very difficult one to share and an emotional one to write. Today, I decided to let go of the game that has formed a large part of my identity, something that has guided my past since I took my first step. While I've achieved amazing accomplishments, created unforgettable memories, and made lifelong friends, listen to this, I've also experienced the darkest times of my life, to the point where instead of building me up, it began to destroy me, where I began to despise and question the value of myself much more than those surrounding me could ever see or know. Intrusive thoughts, waking up nauseous, finding myself struggling to take normal breaths because of the rock that would sit on my chest that seemed to weigh more than I could carry. This is just a brief description of anxiety this sport has caused me. And while I'm grateful for every door that is open for me, I can't continue this fight any longer for something that I've fallen out of love with. What's he saying? I can't do it anymore. I can't keep finding my worth and value based on my performance. It's soul crushing. I can't sleep. I can't eat. There's times where I can't even breathe. And I understand, folks, that we just can't turn off the influence that other people um, have on us. And I understand, like, the deep wounds that it may leave upon your heart if maybe your parents abandoned you at a young age, if maybe your husband cheated on you, destroying your marriage. 
Maybe you're here and you're single and you desire to be in a relationship and be married, but it just hasn't happened yet. I understand that's hard and difficult. Just don't allow it to question your worth and your value. Allow God to speak over your life. And God says this, as an image bearer of God, you're of infinite worth and infinite value. And this is gospel truth, again, that can carry us to a place of supernatural peace. Amen? Number two, folks, we're going to keep moving along. That was my longest point. It's down here, downhill from here, everybody. Number two, look to Jesus. And when I say look to Jesus, I'm talking about looking at the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. When we look at the life of Jesus, we see a man on a mission. This is the God-man, Jesus of Nazareth, giving absolutely everything to bring us back to a joy-filled, life-giving relationship with God. If you have those Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 15. I love to see people turn down and actually turn those Bibles. That's amazing. Let's keep it going. Turn to Luke chapter 15. Now, there's some of you that may be super familiar with Luke 15. Luke 15 is kind of um, unified by a series of different parables. There's the parable of the lost coin, there's the parable of the lost sheep, and there's the parable of the lost, the, the wayward kind of brothers. There's the older brother and, and the younger brother. I want us to look at the parable of the lost sheep. And in this parable, it's super simple. There's a shepherd who has a hundred sheep. One of those sheep runs astray. One of those sheep goes, goes wayward. And this good shepherd leaves the 99, gives of himself, gives everything he can to find the lost sheep. Now when he finds the lost sheep, he puts it upon his shoulder and he rejoices. This is what I want you to hear. Jesus is the good shepherd. This is what the life of Jesus is all about. And we are the wayward sheep. This is what I love about the Bible. The Bible has a high view of humanity made in the image of God, but also a sobering view of humanity that each of us kind of have dark and sinful and evil tendencies that each of us have turned away from God. But God's love for us is so great that he sends his one and only son on this rescue mission to bring us back to himself. New City, this is what the gospel is all about. It's this happy reunion between wayward sheep and a good shepherd. New City, you, you want to know how valuable you are, how important you are? Don't look to the world, look to Jesus. In fact, look to the Father. The Father says, you're so valuable that I'm going to send my son. And in a mysterious way, I'm going to give up some of the, like, a perfect unity between the Father and the Son in kind of eternal glory. And the Son's going to enter into this world. The Father sends His beloved Son because He thinks you're so valuable. You want to know how valuable you are? Look to Jesus. Again, Jesus leaves the Father. He enters into the brokenness and mess of this world. He comes into this world as a man and gives his life to the point of death on a cross, so again, we can experience this happy reunion. This is the good news of the gospel. I remember when I was a little kid, eight, nine years old, um, you guys have probably had a similar experience, but when I was eight and nine years old, I lost my little puppy dog. And as an eight or nine-year-old, again, it was just like absolutely devastating. But I wasn't going to give up. I was going to do everything I can to find that little puppy dog. So we put signs kind of on the telephone poles. I remember going on walks with my mom and just yelling out my dog's name. We would call the pound. We would drive to the pound. We did everything we could until we got to the point where we had that happy reunion. My love for my dog was seen in part to the great lengths that I went to to rescue that dog and find that dog. I want you to think about the great lengths that God has gone for you. And God knows your mess. He knows your weaknesses. He knows the thoughts you have. 
He knows what you do behind closed doors. And despite all of that, God says, no, you're so valuable. You're so important to me. I'm giving my son and we're coming after you. Again, I don't want us to look to the world. If you're here today and you're anxious because you're constantly trying to figure out how valuable you are, maybe you're looking to social media to tell you how great you are, I want you to look to Jesus. Specifically, I want you to look to the story of redemption, this rescue story where God says, I love you so much, I'm sending my son for you. Again, this is gospel truth that in moments of anxiousness can lead us to gospel peace. If you're here today, and again, I, maybe you're like, I don't know what the gospel is. I don't know what redemption is. I don't really even understand who Jesus is or what Jesus has done for you. I just want to encourage you, sign up for Gospel Roots. Gospel Roots, look at that. Just like we had it all planned out. The slide was ready. <laughs> sign up for Gospel Roots. Go online. Go to the Next Steps table. We would love to just help you understand really the heart of this book, this story, and what God is doing in this world. Number three, new city. Instead of looking to the world, I want to say this. Let's look to the church. And when I say look to the church, I mean look to the people of God. On its best day, and this is really important, new city, on its best day, the church is meant to be a community of people that will remind us of God's love. On its best day, the people here in this room, in these chairs, are meant to encourage us when we're experiencing anxiety. On its best day, the people of God are meant to speak truth in love over our lives. When I was in fifth grade, you guys had a teacher like this. Maybe you had a parent like this. Uh, I we lived in North Sacramento. I went to Hazel Stroud Elementary School, the glory days of my life. Fifth grade, Mr. Skaggs class, and we were, we were a bad group of kids. And Mr. Skaggs was so desperate to gain control and authority over his class, he pulled out the marbles and the jar. And you've seen the marbles and the jar, but it's a, basically a way to motivate kids with a pizza party at the end of the, the journey to be good. So if the class listened, we got marbles in the jar, right? If the class stood in a straight line, we got marbles in a jar. And when it got to the top, pizza party. Again, for a fifth grade class, pizza party was like the best day of your life. But if we were bad, like we often were, he would take marbles out of the jar. Now, I'm just here to just like confess to you some of my own struggles. This is real. This is some of Pastor Gabe's real struggles. I realized that I've shaped most of my life by the philosophy of the marbles in the jar, finding my worth and value based on the good things I do in this world. So, if I'm a good father, I feel good about myself, and I put marbles in the jar. If I love my wife well, I'm feeling good about myself, and I'm putting marbles in the jar. If the church is going well, and you got to show up, even if it's not raining outside, I'm feeling good, I'm putting marbles in the jar. And the jar starts getting filled, and I'm finding my worth and value based on this full jar. But oftentimes, I'm not a good father. Oftentimes, I don't love my wife like Christ loved the church. And oftentimes, I'm not the best pastor in the world. And so those times, in my own mind, I'm pouring marbles out of the jar. And then when my jar is empty, again, I'm feeling anxious, worthless, like I don't bring real value to this world. And this is why Pastor Gabe needs the church. I need God's people to say, Gabe, your worth and value isn't based on the marbles. Throw the marbles out. Your worth and value is based on God's love for you and what he has done for you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I need people to remind me. I'm wondering if you need people to remind you. The word church, the Greek, it's ekklesia, literally means gathering. We're a gathering of people around the person and the work of Jesus. And we can be honest, New City, the church hasn't been and never will be perfect. And for many of us in this room, maybe the church has actually been a source of suffering, harm, and actually causing us to live anxious lives. I just want to encourage us, it doesn't have to be that way. We could be a people, a gathering, around the person and work of Jesus who help each other through our journey with anxiety. 
The church isn't a building. The church isn't an event on Sundays. The church is a family that we've been brought into. And we're meant to care for one another in the deepest of ways. Galatians 6.2 says this, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Just as Jesus has carried our greatest burdens, that's the sin that separated us from the Father, so we're called to be in relationship with one another and bear each other's burdens. This is one of the greatest privileges we have in this life, that we can actually grow to be so close to one another, we can help each other through all of our struggles, that we would find joy to give ourselves to help more and more people experience peace. And I think very practically, we can help each other carry each other's burdens by listening, asking good questions, showing empathy, and speaking truth. And I think the order is pretty important. We shouldn't start just by speaking, but listening and actually seeing people in front of us, not thinking about the sports scores, not thinking about the to-do list, being so engaged that we're willing to ask good, important, and challenging questions, showing empathy and care, and then finally speaking truth. And just so you know, New City, Pastor Gabe doesn't need your truth. I need God's truth. I need you guys to remind me, and I'm going to do everything I can to remind you, not of my truth, but of what God's Word says. This is an amazing privilege we have. Let's carry each other's burdens, helping each other experience more of God's peace by listening, asking good questions, showing empathy, and speaking truth in love. This is the church I imagine we can become. I know there's no perfect church, and I know many of us have had bad church experiences, but this is the church we can become. As we realize how God cares for us, we can begin caring for one another. And again, for the little in-sermon commercial, this is why city groups matter so much. Hit them with the slide, Alex. <laughs> There's just something special that happens in smaller groups where we can kind of let down the facade, be more honest and vulnerable with one another, and again, kind of have that place where we're um, listening, asking good questions, showing empathy, and speaking truth and love. If you're not in a city group, it doesn't mean you can't live out the, the beauty of biblical church life. This is just one of the ways we're trying to foster some of those relationships. Again, website, next steps table. We got six groups throughout the East Bay. Maybe you're finding yourself like the, the guy from the Dallas Mavericks, unable to breathe this, this kind of feeling in your chest. You find yourself anxious. Maybe you need God's people. God's people can help you experience God's peace. So what? What does this all mean for us? Let me conclude with just a couple of encouragements. Maybe these are a little bit more practical. Number one, I want to encourage you to confront anxiety with gratitude. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You want to know what the will of God is for your life? Like, I don't know if you should move to Atlanta, but God says this, you should be thankful. This has been one of my, like, kind of uh, challenges for the new year, starting every morning, making a list in my journal of just the things that I'm thankful for, and allowing that kind of spirit of gratitude to carry me to this place of joy and peace. Number two, confront anxiety with community. We just talked about this. Don't run away from the church, run to the church. Don't isolate yourself from others. Engage with godly people. We're going to listen and ask good questions, show empathy, and speak truth in love. And number three, confront anxiety with rest. We open to the first pages in the Bible, Genesis, the climax of God's kind of creative experience, the, the seven days, the climax of God's creation is rest. And God didn't rest because he was tired and overwhelmed. God rested because he wanted to delight in everything that he created. Yeah. And I think he invites us to rest as well. Yeah. And I think when we rest, when we set aside two hours, four hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, whatever it is, when we set aside time to rest, it's almost this form of resistance. No longer am I going to find my identity by the things I'm doing. I'm just going to rest and be with God and allow God to speak truth 
over my life. New City, um, we just wanted to acknowledge this week that each and every one of us are tempted to find our worth, our value, our identity in the world. But oftentimes the world will, will tell us this, you're not enough. You're not enough. It's a lie that's been going on for generations. In fact, if we continue to read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, we would see it's a lie that's as old as creation. The enemy whispering this lie into the ears of Adam and Eve, you're not enough. And I wonder how many of us have been believing that lie. I'm not enough. Today, we want to reject that lie. And we want to hold on to gospel truth, that my worth and my value is found in being an image bearer of God and somebody who is loved by Jesus Christ. Allow this gospel truth, New City, to lead us to a place of peace. Let's pray.